Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. A Room with a View By E. M. Forster Chapter 13 How Miss Bartlett's Boiler Was So Tiresome How often had Lucy rehearsed this bow, this interview? But she had always rehearsed them indoors, and with certain accessories, which surely we have a right to assume. Who could foretell that she and George would meet in the rout of a civilization, amidst an army of coats and collars and boots that lay wounded over the sunlit earth? She had imagined a young Mr. Emerson, who might be shy or morbid or indifferent or furtively impudent. She was prepared for all of these. But she had never imagined one who would be happy and greet her with the shout of the morning star. Indoors herself, partaking of tea with old Mrs. Butterworth, she reflected that it is impossible to foretell the future with any degree of accuracy, that it is impossible to rehearse life. A fault in the scenery, a face in the audience, an eruption of the audience onto the stage, and all our carefully planned gestures mean nothing, or mean too much. I will bow, she had thought. I will not shake hands with him. That will be just the proper thing. She had bowed, but to whom? To God, to heroes, to the nonsense of schoolgirls. She had bowed across the rubbish that cumbers the world. So ran her thoughts, while her faculties were busy with Cecil. It was another of those dreadful engagement calls. Mrs. Butterworth had wanted to see him, and he did not want to be seen. He did not want to hear about hydrangeas, why they changed their color at the seaside. He did not want to join the C.O.S. When cross he was always elaborate, and made long, clever answers where, yes, or, no, would have done. Lucy soothed him and tinkered at the conversation in a way that promised well for their married peace. No one is perfect, and surely it is wiser to discover the imperfections before wedlock. Miss Bartlett, indeed, though not in word, had taught the girl that this our life contains nothing satisfactory. Lucy, though she disliked the teacher, regarded the teaching as profound, and applied it to her lover. Lucy, said her mother, when they got home, is anything the matter with Cecil? The question was ominous, up till now Mrs. Honeychurch had behaved with charity and restraint. No, I don't think so, mother. Cecil's all right. Perhaps he's tired. Lucy compromised, perhaps Cecil was a little tired. Because otherwise, she pulled out her bonnet pins with gathering displeasure, because otherwise I cannot account for him. I do think Mrs. Butterworth is rather tiresome, if you mean that. Cecil has told you to think so. You were devoted to her as a little girl, and nothing will describe her goodness to you through the typhoid fever. No, it is just the same thing everywhere. Let me just put your bonnet away, may I? Surely he could answer her civilly for one half hour? Cecil has a very high standard for people, faltered Lucy, seeing trouble ahead. It's part of his ideals, it is really that that makes him sometimes seem, oh, rubbish. If high ideals make a young man rude, the sooner he gets rid of them the better, said Mrs. Honeychurch, handing her the bonnet. Now, mother. I've seen you cross with Mrs. Butterworth yourself. Not in that way. At times I could wring her neck. But not in that way. No. It is the same with Cecil all over. By the by, I never told you. I had a letter from Charlotte while I was away in London. This attempt to divert the conversation was too puerile, and Mrs. Honeychurch resented it. Since Cecil came back from London, nothing appears to please him. Whenever I speak he winces, I see him, Lucy, it is useless to contradict me. No doubt I am neither artistic nor literary nor intellectual nor musical, but I cannot help the drawing-room furniture, your father bought it and we must put up with it, will Cecil kindly remember. I. I see what you mean, and certainly Cecil oughtn't to. But he does not mean to be uncivil, he once explained, it is the things that upset him, 
He is easily upset by ugly things, he is not uncivil to people. Is it a thing or a person when Freddie sings? You can't expect a really musical person to enjoy comic songs as we do. Then why didn't he leave the room? Why sit wriggling and sneering and spoiling everyone's pleasure? We mustn't be unjust to people, faltered Lucy. Something had enfeebled her, and the case for Cecil, which she had mastered so perfectly in London, would not come forth in an effective form. The two civilizations had clashed, Cecil hinted that they might, and she was dazzled and bewildered, as though the radiance that lies behind all civilization had blinded her eyes. Good taste and bad taste were only catchwords, garments of diverse cut, and music itself dissolved to a whisper through pine trees, where the song is not distinguishable from the comic song. She remained in much embarrassment, while Mrs. Honeychurch changed her frock for dinner, and every now and then she said a word, and made things no better. There was no concealing the fact, Cecil had meant to be supercilious, and he had succeeded. And Lucy, she knew not why, wished that the trouble could have come at any other time. Go and dress, dear, you'll be late. All right, mother, don't say, all right, and stop. Go. She obeyed, but loitered disconsolately at the landing window. It faced north, so there was little view, and no view of the sky. Now, as in the winter, the pine trees hung close to her eyes. One connected the landing window with depression. No definite problem menaced her, but she sighed to herself, Oh, dear, what shall I do, what shall I do? It seemed to her that everyone else was behaving very badly. And she ought not to have mentioned Miss Bartlett's letter. She must be more careful, her mother was rather inquisitive, and might have asked what it was about. Oh, dear, what should she do, and then Freddy came bounding upstairs, and joined the ranks of the ill-behaved. I say, those are topping people. My dear baby, how tiresome you've been. You have no business to take them bathing in the sacred lake, it's much too public. It was all right for you but most awkward for everyone else. Do be more careful. You forget the place is growing half suburban. I say, is anything on tomorrow week? Not that I know of. Then I want to ask the Emersons up to Sunday tennis. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Freddy, I wouldn't do that with all this muddle. What's wrong with the court? They won't mind a bump or two, and I've ordered new balls. I meant it's better not. I really mean it. He seized her by the elbows and humorously danced her up and down the passage. She pretended not to mind, but she could have screamed with temper. Cecil glanced at them as he proceeded to his toilet and they impeded Mary with her brood of hot water cans. Then Mrs. Honeychurch opened her door and said, Lucy, what a noise you're making. I have something to say to you. Did you say you had had a letter from Charlotte, and Freddie ran away? Yes. I really can't stop. I must dress too. How's Charlotte? All right. Lucy. The unfortunate girl returned. You've a bad habit of hurrying away in the middle of one's sentences. Did Charlotte mention her boiler? Her what? Don't you remember that her boiler was to be had out in October, and her bath cistern cleaned out, and all kinds of terrible to-doings? I can't remember all Charlotte's worries, said Lucy bitterly. I shall have enough of my own, now that you are not pleased with Cecil. Mrs. Honeychurch might have flamed out. She did not. She said, Come here, old lady, thank you for putting away my bonnet, kiss me. And, though nothing is perfect, Lucy felt for the moment that her mother in Windy Corner and the wheeled in the declining sun were perfect. So the grittiness went out of life. It generally did at Windy Corner. At the last minute, when the social machine was clogged hopelessly, one member or other of the family poured in a drop of oil. Cecil despised their methods, perhaps rightly. At all events, they were not his own. Dinner was at half past seven. Freddy gabbled the grace, and they drew up their heavy chairs and fell to. 
Fortunately, the men were hungry. Nothing untoward occurred until the pudding. Then Freddy said, Lucy, what's Emerson like? I saw him in Florence, said Lucy, hoping that this would pass for a reply. Is he the clever sort, or is he a decent chap? Ask Cecil, it is Cecil who brought him here. He is the clever sort, like myself, said Cecil. Freddy looked at him doubtfully. How well did you know them at the Bertolini, asked Mrs. Honeychurch. Oh, very slightly. I mean, Charlotte knew them even less than I did. Oh, that reminds me, you never told me what Charlotte said in her letter. One thing and another, said Lucy, wondering whether she would get through the meal without a lie. Among other things, that an awful friend of hers had been bicycling through Summer Street, wondered if she'd come up and see us, and mercifully didn't. Lucy, I do call the way you talk unkind. She was a novelist, said Lucy craftily. The remark was a happy one, for nothing roused Mrs. Honeychurch so much as literature in the hands of females. She would abandon every topic to inveigh against those women who, instead of minding their houses and their children, seek notoriety by print. Her attitude was, if books must be written, let them be written by men, and she developed it at great length, while Cecil yawned and Freddie played at, this year, next year, now, never, with his plum stones, and Lucy artfully fed the flames of her mother's wrath. But soon the conflagration died down, and the ghosts began to gather in the darkness. There were too many ghosts about. The original ghost, that touch of lips on her cheek, had surely been laid long ago, it could be nothing to her that a man had kissed her on a mountain once. But it had begotten a spectral family, Mr. Harris, Miss Bartlett's letter, Mr. Beebe's memories of violets, and one or other of these was bound to haunt her before Cecil's very eyes. It was Miss Bartlett who returned now, and with appalling vividness. I have been thinking, Lucy, of that letter of Charlotte's. How is she? I tore the thing up. Didn't she say how she was? How does she sound? Cheerful? Oh, yes I suppose so, no, not very cheerful, I suppose. Then, depend upon it, it is the boiler. I know myself how water preys upon one's mind. I would rather anything else, even a misfortune with the meat. Cecil laid his hand over his eyes. So would I, asserted Freddy, backing his mother up, backing up the spirit of her remark rather than the substance. And I have been thinking, she added rather nervously, surely we could squeeze Charlotte in here next week, and give her a nice holiday while the plumbers at Tunbridge Wells finish. I have not seen poor Charlotte for so long. It was more than her nerves could stand. And she could not protest violently after her mother's goodness to her upstairs. Mother, no, she pleaded. It's impossible. We can't have Charlotte on the top of the other things, we're squeezed to death as it is. Freddy's got a friend coming Tuesday, there's Cecil, and you've promised to take in Minnie Beebe because of the diphtheria scare. It simply can't be done. Nonsense. It can. If Minnie sleeps in the bath. Not otherwise. Minnie can sleep with you. I won't have her. Then, if you're so selfish, Mr. Floyd must share a room with Freddy. Miss Bartlett, Miss Bartlett, Miss Bartlett, moaned Cecil, again laying his hand over his eyes. It's impossible, repeated Lucy. I don't want to make difficulties, but it really isn't fair on the maids to fill up the house so. Alas. The truth is, dear, you don't like Charlotte. No, I don't. And no more does Cecil. She gets on our nerves. You haven't seen her lately, and don't realize how tiresome she can be, though so good. So please, mother, don't worry us this last summer, but spoil us by not asking her to come. Here, here, said Cecil. Mrs. Honeychurch, with more gravity than usual, and with more feeling than she usually permitted herself, replied, this isn't very kind of you too. You have each other and all these woods to walk in, 
so full of beautiful things, and poor Charlotte has only the water turned off and plumbers. You are young, dears, and however clever young people are, and however many books they read, they will never guess what it feels like to grow old. Cecil crumbled his bread. I must say Cousin Charlotte was very kind to me that year I called on my bike, put in Freddy. She thanked me for coming till I felt like such a fool, and fussed round no end to get an egg boiled for my tea just right. I know, dear. She is kind to everyone, and yet Lucy makes this difficulty when we try to give her some little return. But Lucy hardened her heart. It was no good being kind to Miss Bartlett. She had tried herself too often and too recently. One might lay up treasure in heaven by the attempt, but one enriched neither Miss Bartlett nor anyone else upon earth. She was reduced to saying, I can't help it, mother. I don't like Charlotte. I admit it's horrid of me. From your own account, you told her as much. Well, she would leave Florence so stupidly. She flurried, the ghosts were returning, they filled Italy, they were even usurping the places she had known as a child. The sacred lake would never be the same again, and, on Sunday week, something would even happen to Windy Corner. How would she fight against ghosts? For a moment the visible world faded away, and memories and emotions alone seemed real. I suppose Miss Bartlett must come, since she boils eggs so well, said Cecil, who was in rather a happier frame of mind, thanks to the admirable cooking. I didn't mean the egg was well boiled, corrected Freddy, because in point of fact she forgot to take it off, and as a matter of fact I don't care for eggs. I only meant how jolly kind she seemed. Cecil frowned again. Oh, these honey churches. Eggs, boilers, hydrangeas, maids, of such were their lives compact. May me and Lucy get down from our chairs, he asked, with scarcely veiled insolence. We don't want no dessert. Chapter 14 How Lucy Faced the External Situation Bravely Of course Miss Bartlett accepted. And, equally of course, she felt sure that she would prove a nuisance, and begged to be given an inferior spare room, something with no view, anything. Her love to Lucy. And, equally of course, George Emerson could come to tennis on the Sunday week. Lucy faced the situation bravely, though, like most of us, she only faced the situation that encompassed her. She never gazed inwards. If at times strange images rose from the depths, she put them down to nerves. When Cecil brought the Emersons to Summer Street, it had upset her nerves. Charlotte would burnish up past foolishness, and this might upset her nerves. She was nervous at night. When she talked to George, they met again almost immediately at the rectory, his voice moved her deeply, and she wished to remain near him. How dreadful if she really wished to remain near him. Of course, the wish was due to nerves, which love to play such perverse tricks upon us. Once she had suffered from things that came out of nothing and meant she didn't know what. Now Cecil had explained psychology to her one wet afternoon, and all the troubles of youth in an unknown world could be dismissed. It is obvious enough for the reader to conclude, she loves young Emerson. A reader in Lucy's place would not find it obvious. Life is easy to chronicle, but bewildering to practice, and we welcome, nerves, or any other shibboleth that will cloak our personal desire. She loved Cecil, George made her nervous, will the reader explain to her that the phrases should have been reversed? But the external situation, she will face that bravely. The meeting at the rectory had passed off well enough. Standing between Mr. Beebe and Cecil, she had made a few temperate allusions to Italy, and George had replied. She was anxious to show that she was not shy, and was glad that he did not seem shy either. A nice fellow, said Mr. Beebe afterwards, he will work off his crudities in time. I rather mistrust young men who slip into life gracefully. Lucy said, he seems in better spirits. He laughs more. Yes, replied the clergyman. 
he is waking up. That was all. But, as the week wore on, more of her defenses fell, and she entertained an image that had physical beauty. In spite of the clearest directions, Miss Bartlett contrived to bungle her arrival. She was due at the southeastern station at Dorking, whither Mrs. Honeychurch drove to meet her. She arrived at the London and Brighton station, and had to hire a cab up. No one was at home except Freddie and his friend, who had to stop their tennis and to entertain her for a solid hour. Cecil and Lucy turned up at four o'clock, and these, with little mini Bibi, made a somewhat lugubrious sextet upon the upper lawn for tea. I shall never forgive myself, said Miss Bartlett, who kept on rising from her seat, and had to be begged by the United Company to remain. I have upset everything. Bursting in on young people. But I insist on paying for my cab up. Grant that, at any rate. Our visitors never do such dreadful things, said Lucy, while her brother, in whose memory the boiled egg had already grown unsubstantial, exclaimed in irritable tones, just what I've been trying to convince cousin Charlotte of, Lucy, for the last half hour. I do not feel myself an ordinary visitor, said Miss Bartlett, and looked at her frayed glove. All right, if you'd really rather. Five shillings, and I gave a bob to the driver. Miss Bartlett looked in her purse. Only sovereigns and pennies. Could anyone give her change? Freddie had half a quid and his friend had four half crowns. Miss Bartlett accepted their monies and then said, But who am I to give the sovereign to? Let's leave it all till mother comes back, suggested Lucy. No, dear, your mother may take quite a long drive now that she is not hampered with me. We all have our little foibles, and mine is the prompt settling of accounts. Here Freddy's friend, Mr. Floyd, made the one remark of his that need be quoted, he offered to toss Freddy for Miss Bartlett's quid. A solution seemed in sight, and even Cecil, who had been ostentatiously drinking his tea at the view, felt the eternal attraction of chance, and turned round. But this did not do, either. Please, please, I know I am a sad spoilsport, but it would make me wretched. I should practically be robbing the one who lost. Freddy owes me fifteen shillings, interposed Cecil. So it will work out right if you give the pound to me. Fifteen shillings, said Miss Bartlett dubiously. How is that, Mr. Vice? Because, don't you see, Freddy paid your cab. Give me the pound, and we shall avoid this deplorable gambling. Miss Bartlett, who was poor at figures, became bewildered and rendered up the sovereign, amidst the suppressed gurgles of the other youths. For a moment Cecil was happy. He was playing at nonsense among his peers. Then he glanced at Lucy, in whose face petty anxieties had marred the smiles. In January he would rescue his Leonardo from this stupefying twaddle. But I don't see that, exclaimed Minnie Beebe who had narrowly watched the iniquitous transaction. I don't see why Mr. Vice is to have the quid. Because of the fifteen shillings and the five, they said solemnly. Fifteen shillings and five shillings make one pound, you see. But I don't see, they tried to stifle her with cake. No, thank you. I'm done. I don't see why, Freddy, don't poke me. Miss Honeychurch, your brother's hurting me. Ow. What about Mr. Floyd's ten shillings? Ow. No, I don't see and I never shall see why Miss What's-Her-Name shouldn't pay that bob for the driver. I had forgotten the driver, said Miss Bartlett, reddening. Thank you, dear, for reminding me. A shilling was it? Can anyone give me change for half a crown? I'll get it said the young hostess, rising with decision. Cecil, give me that sovereign. No, give me up that sovereign. I'll get Euphemia to change it, and we'll start the whole thing again from the beginning. Lucy, Lucy, what a nuisance I am, protested Miss Bartlett, and followed her across the lawn. Lucy tripped ahead, simulating hilarity. When they were out of earshot Miss Bartlett stopped her wails and said quite briskly, have you told him about him yet? No, I haven't, 
replied Lucy, and then could have bitten her tongue for understanding so quickly what her cousin meant. Let me see, a sovereign's worth of silver. She escaped into the kitchen. Miss Bartlett's sudden transitions were too uncanny. It sometimes seemed as if she planned every word she spoke or caused to be spoken, as if all this worry about cabs and change had been a ruse to surprise the soul. No, I haven't told Cecil or anyone, she remarked, when she returned. I promised you I shouldn't. Here is your money, all shillings, except two half-crowns. Would you count it? You can settle your debt nicely now. Miss Bartlett was in the drawing room, gazing at the photograph of St. John ascending, which had been framed. How dreadful, she murmured, how more than dreadful, if Mr. Vice should come to hear of it from some other source. Oh, no, Charlotte, said the girl, entering the battle. George Emerson is all right, and what other source is there? Miss Bartlett considered. For instance, the driver. I saw him looking through the bushes at you, remember he had a violet between his teeth. Lucy shuddered a little. We shall get the silly affair on our nerves if we aren't careful. How could a Florentine cab driver ever get hold of Cecil? We must think of every possibility. Oh, it's all right. Or perhaps old Mr. Emerson knows. In fact, he is certain to know. I don't care if he does. I was grateful to you for your letter, but even if the news does get round, I think I can trust Cecil to laugh at it. To contradict it? No, to laugh at it. But she knew in her heart that she could not trust him, for he desired her untouched. Very well, dear, you know best. Perhaps gentlemen are different to what they were when I was young. Ladies are certainly different. Now, Charlotte. She struck at her playfully. You kind, anxious thing. What would you have me do? First you say, don't tell, and then you say, tell. Which is it to be? Quick. Miss Bartlett sighed, I am no match for you in conversation, dearest. I blush when I think how I interfered at Florence, and you so well able to look after yourself, and so much cleverer in all ways than I am. You will never forgive me. Shall we go out, then? They will smash all the china if we don't. For the air rang with the shrieks of Minnie, who was being scalped with a teaspoon. Dear, one moment, we may not have this chance for a chat again. Have you seen the young one yet? Yes, I have. What happened? We met at the rectory. What line is he taking up? No line. He talked about Italy, like any other person. It is really all right. What advantage would he get from being a cad, to put it bluntly? I do wish I could make you see it my way. He really won't be any nuisance, Charlotte. Once a cad, always a cad. That is my poor opinion. Lucy paused. Cecil said one day, and I thought it so profound, that there are two kinds of cads, the conscious and the subconscious. She paused again, to be sure of doing justice to Cecil's profundity. Through the window she saw Cecil himself, turning over the pages of a novel. It was a new one from Smith's library. Her mother must have returned from the station. Once a cad, always a cad, droned Miss Bartlett. What I mean by subconscious is that Emerson lost his head. I fell into all those violets, and he was silly and surprised. I don't think we ought to blame him very much. It makes such a difference when you see a person with beautiful things behind him unexpectedly. It really does, it makes an enormous difference, and he lost his head, he doesn't admire me, or any of that nonsense, one straw. Freddy rather likes him, and has asked him up here on Sunday, so you can judge for yourself. He has improved, he doesn't always look as if he's going to burst into tears. He is a clerk in the general manager's office at one of the big railways, not a porter. And runs down to his father for weekends. Papa was to do with journalism, but is rheumatic and has retired. 
There. Now for the garden. She took hold of her guest by the arm. Suppose we don't talk about this silly Italian business anymore. We want you to have a nice restful visit at Windy Corner, with no wording. Lucy thought this rather a good speech. The reader may have detected an unfortunate slip in it. Whether Miss Bartlett detected the slip one cannot say, for it is impossible to penetrate into the minds of elderly people. She might have spoken further, but they were interrupted by the entrance of her hostess. Explanations took place, and in the midst of them Lucy escaped, the images throbbing a little more vividly in her brain.